um, to our the IPO president, Mrs. Cuevas Baron, who is a Mexican MP. She has been in politics for the last 20 years and she is the chairperson of the Foreign Relations Committee, which is responsible for the analysis of Mexico's foreign policy. She is the 29th president of the Interparliamentary Union. Mrs. Cuevas Baron, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful invitation. For me, it's great to be with you. Uh, I would like to thank you first, uh, George Serenity. It's uh, wonderful to be with you again. And now, IPU and the OSC are true partners. We are working together. We are learning together. So thank you. Thank you very much for that wonderful opportunity. I am sure that our organizations are going to have more and more in common. We have expertise in different fields, and I am sure that we are going to be able to exchange our knowledge. I would also like to, to thank uh, Roberto. Roberto, thank you very much, because we have a huge coincidence that parliamentarians must be at the center of the parliamentary organizations. It is our duty to set the table for their leadership, for their capacity building and training and programs. So I, I love to have these coincidences with you. So thank you very much for this uh, great chance to be together. And uh, of course, I need to mention Margareta. Uh, we just coincided precisely in this webinar that uh, George was mentioning. At the IPU, we are having very I, I can say huge expertise when it comes to SDGs and how to make them a reality at the country level. But now we need to find also answers because if we do not understand that we need to fight this pandemic, that we need to end this pandemic, we are never going to achieve SDGs. So thank you, Margareta, for joining us at that uh, webinar, I am sure that we are going to coincide in many other events. Thank you very much. Um, going to the topic, uh, I think we all know that we are facing an unprecedented global crisis. This crisis reveals the strengths and weaknesses of our societies. Both these strengths and weaknesses have a strong gender dimension, and parliaments have a key role to play in capitalizing the strengths and addressing weaknesses. Women are the strength of the COVID-19 response by providing essential services and maintaining the social fabric. Women are the majority. Some people say, WHO say that about 70% of the uh, health workers. And uh, if we see that in a, in a bigger perspective, we can see that it is not only at the health sector, it is at the cleaning sector, agriculture, Catering, uh, women are in the front of the pharmacies and grocery stores. They are more than ever the pillars within their families and communities caring for children and the elderly. But women are also particularly impacted when the crisis, uh, during the crisis because of the pre-existing gender-based discrimination. Women are more often than men in unstable jobs that are the first ones to go away. We need to understand that, yes, we are now in a health crisis, but we are going to have, almost for sure, an economic crisis. And the most complicated jobs, the smaller salaries, are always dedicated to women. They tend to be left without social protection by working mostly in the informal sector, such as domestic work or agriculture. They do most of the unpaid household and care work, which is on the rise. They have been left in confinement with abusive partners. Uh, I was very surprised last week with the with some organizations in, at a WHO meeting that every day in the world there are a hundred and thirty-seven homicides, assassinations of women from their own uh, partners. So we can say that I don't know. Can you hear me? There's like a noise. Yes, uh, yes, yes, we can hear you, of course. Most of these deaths are, uh, are uh, um, because of the, the partners or children relatives to, to these women. So we need to understand 
that gender-based violence is not only in parliaments as we are studying all the time. It is also part of women's daily lives and now this confinement is putting women in more and more risk. At the Interparliamentary Union, we have developed a robust plan of action for gender sensitive parliaments. This should become the roadmap for all parliamentary institutions and leaders for the years to come. In the short term, a gender sensitive parliament is one that ensures equal participation of men and women in the relevant oversight committees that are monitoring and guiding the state's response to the crisis. It is a parliament that ensures women's voice are heard in the discussions that shape our emergency responses and policy priorities. One that requests sex disaggregated data and monitoring and requires prioritization of the prevention and response to gender-based violence. Women's parliamentary caucuses and gender equality committees can be at the forefront of the inclusion of these gender dimensions within parliament. And I would like to put a, an accent in an important issue, I think. When it comes to budget committees, women are not that present into those issues, like security or some uh, military areas. But next year is going to be complicated also for budgets. And we need women to be also included in budget allocation in a, in a cross-cutting cross perspective, because that's the only way where we can assure that all policies, all law, are going to have gender lens and that women are going to be included even in the most complicated economic circumstances. Also, as a workplace, parliaments must be careful about the specific needs and risks faced by women's staff. Inequalities in the workplace can be exacerbated due to additional care responsibilities that are more borne by women lower access to IT by women, and the increased risk of domestic violence and online violence which target women in particular. Here, a gender-responsive parliament will be particularly careful and exercise a duty of care towards its female employees. Going forward, enhancing women's leadership in particular uh, in parliament will be a key tool to our success in developing better policies in the future. Yes, we need to give responses for this pandemic right now, but those responses must be also for the future. We need to understand that this crisis is not going to end soon and that Parliament must be key in designing good responses. We know that women in decision making tend to focus on essential goods such as health and education, on the needs of those mostly in need, particularly children, as well as on policy issues that mostly concern women, such as domestic violence and reproductive health. Women leaders also be key to lifting persistent gender discrimination in laws that still affect 2.5 billion of women and girls worldwide. I think that sometimes we are assuming that a lot of rights are are there and, and we can be sure about them but uh, equality is not there in every single country and surely there is a, a movement to, to push back against this uh, this uh, women's rights so i think that we need to keep in mind these 2.5 billion women and girls that are not enjoying fully their human rights to succeed we need to have processes in place to systematically design and review laws, policies, and budget through a gender lens. Gender responsive budgeting sure. and law making will be essential in our building back a better strategy, just as the UN Secretary General was saying. This should be embedded in our national laws and institutional frameworks. Gender budgeting includes allocating sufficient resources to protect women from violence and offering affordable childcare facilities, but also making sure that jobs that are mostly occupied by women are adequately remunerated and that women have equal access to digital technology and financial services that are essential to their economic, social and political empowerment. Trying to put all this together, it means building an environment which is going to be friendly for all women and their own development. 
I also want to stress the importance of rebuilding more resilient societies through inclusive social protection schemes. Countries that have universal health coverage that include everyone in social protection, including those people that are working in the informal sector, that promote shared parental leave for men and women, will be able to avoid many of the weaknesses we are seeing today that affect women disproportionately. At the individual level, as leaders, we must use the media and outreach platforms to challenge existing gender stereotypes and design another social contract. We need to call for better balancing of unpaid household and care work between men and women and show that women in leadership can be the norm, not the exception. This will, be build, this will help build a better tomorrow for everyone. I would like to only to add on a, a very, I think a very important lesson, which is why these, uh, these women, as Hedy was saying, that our heads of state are giving good responses. And I think that it has a, a perhaps simple but important answer. And it means that they care because they know what they were living before they could enter into politics. It means empathy, it means solidarity, and it means understanding. So I think that's something that we need to, to bring uh, to the same basket. I believe that for us who believe in equality, we need to understand that equality needs both women and men. And we cannot build a more inclusive planet, leaving men aside. So welcome all colleagues, men colleagues, to this uh, very important crusade. I think that this is the moment where we need to work together, to work harder, because the pandemic could be a, a moment to build a better society, but also a moment where many men are threatening to bring women back to their houses. So thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, George, I, I wish that we continue working together. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Presidente Cuevas Barón, to President Cuevas Barón. Two minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I think that all these comments and different uh, approaches to gender issues during the COVID pandemic are showing that the most important challenges or even highly unfair situations are coming from a long time ago. I think that we need to learn the lessons that uh, COVID-19 and this pandemic are giving to us. First, that women are absolutely needed. When we say about essential workers, it is clear that it's about women, but about being essential. And I think that that's the reason why we need to uh, redouble and to recommit with, uh, with gender best practices, best legislation. When we are addressing SDGs, the development agenda, we say leave no one behind. But what is behind this very important statement is the parliamentary responsibility. There is no way to achieve these international goals, these international agreements, if they are not translated to real uh, practices, to real solutions at national and, and local level. That means that we need to take a look to review all pieces of legislation. Even the most uh, developed and equal countries are having unequal legislation. There are countries where women, for example, are forced by law to go to work with makeup and high heels and they cannot uh, use uh, glasses. And those are developed countries. So we need to take a look to all different expressions of inequality in legislation to understand that, that it is not only to uh, consider women, it is about prioritizing women and girls, because we need to build a, a different uh, perspective. Uh, only to give you a, a, a very significant number, and I uh, will respect the time, but when we see that only 24% of the seats in Parliament are for women, well, that says a lot, because while some countries, about only, I think it was four, are having parity 
in their parliament composition, there are some other parliaments that are having zero or only one uh, female parliamentarian. So if we are not having equal representation, we are not having equal decisions and inclusions. So that's one of the lessons we need to learn. We have to prioritize women and girls now and later. So thank you very much uh, for organizing this uh, interesting dialogue. And I really hope that we continue working together. I, I really admire what you're doing at the OSCE. I think that this uh, election observation, gender issues are fantastic. So thank you, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure having you.